Okay, good morning. My name is Muthu Kumar. I belong to the Max department here. I was uh, asked to talk on uh, so how we introduce mathematics to the engineering student at their entry level, right? I mean, the first year and second year. But I see there are more senior people, so I think it looks like I have to learn from you than you, than you have to from me. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, we, so we'll try to kind of keep it uh, mutual. I will say something. Uh, if you have something new to pick, please do. If you have any suggestion from your side which will improve, uh, we will we will do that. So, the main aim of this presentation is to tell you what are the courses that we teach to the engineering students at their entry level and why we teach that courses, how we divide that courses and what are the reasons behind it and we will not actually do much behind it. I will actually go into some mathematics. I do not know how many mathematicians are there in the audience, maybe may uh, all our engineers, uh, but I will tell you kind of motivate some questions that actually kind of, uh, motivates us to do those courses. We will probably not answer those questions in the courses, but that is what motivates the contents of the courses and eventually we expect them to understand uh, all these details. Okay? That would be the aim of my talk. So, I will continue and I will stop at one hour wherever we stop. Okay? It, it would be like that. So, uh, so, just to put things in perspective, probably this is the last day, last lecture and so you are all aware how things work, but, but just to kind of put the set the environment. Uh, so, this is for the students who come after JE, after 12th, right, basically. So, the courses that they do here after joining IIT is divided into two types, which are the core courses and the professional courses. Core courses are those that are common to all the engineering students. They do it all in common. And after the first year and, and, and the third semester, they actually uh, divide into departments and then they do their respective departmental courses that we call professional courses. And what I am going to talk today is about the core mathematics program that we teach the uh, sub UG students who come after 12th. So, the core mathematics is taught in uh, three semesters, uh, consecutive semesters. As soon as they join first semester, they do so one, two, three, they do uh, uh, three types of courses in mathematics. And the courses that we follow are basically this calculus and geometry in the first semester linear algebra and ordinary differential equation in the second semester and this complex analysis and partial differential equation are taught at the third semester, but as module courses. When I say module courses, um, that course happens for half a semester. So, it runs for uh, two months and then in the other two months, they will do the uh, other part of the course and the students get divided, they have the choice. For instance, uh, some engineering departments feel that they do not need complex analysis so, they will not send their students to this course, that is why it is module course. And some engineering departments, I do not know which engineering departments, but some feel that they do not need PDE. I cannot think of any de uh, department, but they do not think PDE. Uh, for instance, I think uh, computer science department feels that they do not uh, need PDE. So, they do not send their students for this, so they just do complex analysis. So, that is why it is a module course. So, that flexibility and freedom is there for the students. And why these set of courses? If you actually go back into history and what, I mean all that, all the problems that we want to solve after modeling everything boils down to some equation and those equations before Newton were all algebraic equation, after Newton has come into algebraic or differential equations. Now, to solve or understand the solutions of these equations is what the mathematics tried to do and the entire theory developed around it. Okay? Today, it has spread across more than that. But the basic, I mean, the fundamental is and kind of solving some equation or understanding the solutions of the equation. Where we cannot solve, we try to understand the solution without actually solving it. That's what usually happens in differential equations and integral equations, right? So that's the idea of behind the breakup of these courses. Uh, so I will just go through these courses, not one by one. I'll just show you the contents and. Uh, just ask some important questions which we expect the student to understand at the end of the course or at least be able to answer, though we will not answer that in the course because that is much difficult. Uh, this is just to tell us how our semester is uh, divided. Our semester is usually semester by definition is 6 months, but including exams, vacation, everything, it, boy, it kind of comes down to 4 months is a semester actually and 4 months basically means 
uh, we have uh, around 14 weeks and we have three lectures and one tutorial per week and that is how we plan I mean our semester is organized. So, we usually um, plan our lecture I mean plan our course lecture wise that is we know what we are going to teach the students in the first lecture, second lecture and so on. So, ideally we will have around 40 to 42 lectures in a semester and we know beforehand what we will teach in each lecture. So, that is actually divided and since we know what we will complete in a week, we actually have an assignment uh, uh, sheet prepared every week for the tutorial session which will be circulated to them beforehand. So, since we know what we will teach in the week, so that contents so related problems are given in the assignment and that is what uh, they do and our evaluation is we usually have minimum 4 exams that are uh, 2 quiz that is first a quiz and a mid sum and then another quiz and an end sum and that is how uh, and we evaluate based on the performance of these and we also tell our students beforehand how the course will run in the sense what we will teach they should know the contents of the course and how they will be evaluated what are the kind of breakup of the evaluation for the assignments, for the tutorial, for the attendance if attendance is considered all that. So, they know what they should actually input to really I mean at the end of the course they can't come I did not know that this was kind of part of evaluation or that of part of evaluation. So, all that is made clear in the first course handout and so on. So, this is the practice that we follow here. So, this is the contents that we follow which you all uh, either you would have done this course or in your college or university the maths department should be following roughly around these things. Of course, I, we will not go into that. So, if you actually look at these contents and uh, see, so what is the first thing that we teach our mathematics students at the first level if you remember is uh, what is called the uh, continuum uh, continuum hypothesis right and uh, sorry continuum property of the real numbers. So, ideally the idea is that students should understand uh, that infinity is not a number that is one. So, basically they should understand two things one things are which are much larger than our say kind of perception which is like infinity and things which are much smaller than our perception which is infinitesimal. So, these two differences and the understanding of these two quantities is something which students should understand because usually they treat infinity like a number and they work with number right most of engineers know I mean infinity plus infinity or the number plus infinity they try to treat it like a number, but ideally uh, infinity is not a number it is just a notion that we associate to something that we cannot grasp right. So, this has to be uh, kind of kind of given to the students, but we cannot give it directly because they are not matured enough to do that. Yeah, I am going to come to that. So, that is what I am. Um, so, so, this is something one I mean uh, something which one can introduce to say that infinity is actually not number. So, so this paradox is based on the fact that suppose say I have a hotel room with say 5 rooms ok and there are 5 guests and the and the hotel is full. So, if a new guest comes to the hotel what would and suppose you are the receptionist you would ideally tell them that well the hotel is full. So, there are no I mean rooms available you please find some other hotel or something that is what you should. Now, infinity is not like 5 or 6 or 10 it can be treated in this sense by this. Uh, so, Hilbert posed this problem uh, when this infinity notion was coming into picture. So, he said suppose imagine a hotel which has infinite number of uh, rooms right like say there is a room number 1, room number 2, room number 3, 4, 5 for all natural numbers ok and there are guests in all the rooms. So, Hilbert says that infinity is not a number you see because it can be treated like this. Uh, suppose there is a new guest coming in ideally what you should say all the rooms are full. So, please find some other hotel he says no I do not have to what so any number of guests comes I can fill the hotel how ok new guest comes what I do I shift the guest in room number 1 to room number 2 I shift the guest in room number 2 to room number 3 I keep doing this by doing this I have room number 1 vacant and I can keep doing this because that keeps going on. So, I am shifting there somewhere in infinity no problem room number 1 becomes empty I give it to the new guest yeah. Yeah it is, but yeah, but plus 1 plus n anything, but that is how you want to understand it, but 
plus operation can be, but it, it should not be treated as a number because infinity is not some last number or something, right. It, it is just a word given to a notion that uh, something is uh, kind of eternity not stopping at all. Yeah, end is unknown. I mean, end is, I mean, whether there is even an end or not, we do not know. It is something that we do not know. It just keeps going on, right. Like our universe, whether it is finite or infinity, I, I do not know. So, that is the Hilbert's hotel paradox. So, he says that, uh, so that means if I have an infinite number of hotel room, which practically probably is not possible, he says that I can always accommodate new guests. Now, with this policy, I can actually accommodate any number of guests. I do not have to even tell anyone that the room is full. So, based on this if you look into the mathematics what we understand is there is an infinity which is the which is the cardinality of the natural numbers and one can actually show that this cardinality of natural numbers is same as the cardinality of the so the number of natural numbers is same as the number of integers which is actually a bigger set than the natural numbers in this case yeah uh, why you want to shift to the second room when the new guest comes he can put to the last one which is the what is the last what is the last room? That's that, so that's the point that we want to emphasize here. There is no last because so what is the last number of the natural numbers? Only then I can put it there. Once you think of a last there, you can't do this process. Then it stops. Then all the rooms are occupied. The fact that there is no last is the catching thing there. Okay, which is why I'm not working with the last. I'm working with the first because that I know. So it starts right. So. And then again, this is also counterintuitive. Usually, in a finite set, I think that if I have five elements, and then there are ten uh, elements, and if I pick five, then the smaller set has more of elements than the bigger set that I pick, right? It is so. This is also a property of finiteness. That is not true with infinity. The natural number is a subset of integers. The integers is a subset of rationals, but they all have same cardinality. This is again something that does not happen with finiteness Th and that again is a new notion of um, so, so some property of infinity which is not true with finiteness right all these have the same cardinality. Now the question is okay we have uh, all these are infinite fine but so that means the number of elements in the real numbers is also infinite right. Now it turns out that uh, one can show that these two are not of same cardinality. Right. So, the number of elements in R or even the interval 0 1 also has infinite number of elements, but that infinity is a bigger infinity than the infinity of n, z or q, okay, which is why we use this. Uh, so, there is this notation LF naught for countably infinite and this is called uncountably infinite. So, these were done by a guy called Cantor. So, if you have heard of Cantor set and he was a mathematician. Uh, who actually worked out all these things and that is when Hilbert gave all these paradox and all <coughs> things. And I do not know if it is surprising or not, finally at the end of his life he was spending his life in a mental asylum. So, um, Hilbert. no not Hilbert, Cantor. Cantor was the one who worked, I mean who kind of formalized the entire set theory. I am so not saying that if you work in set theory you end up there, uh, I am just, <laughs> I am just giving a side story that. Uh, he was there. So, no wonder he could think of this counterintuitive stuff. I mean, he was thinking differently basically, that is what I want to say. So, then, um, so the next question comes is that okay, there is an infinity and there is a bigger infinity like numbers, there is 0, there is 1, there is 2, and there are numbers in between 0 and 1. So, you pick half, there are numbers between 0 and half. So, can I ask the same question? I have an infinity which is LF naught, which is countably infinite. I have an infinity which is uncountably infinite. So, are there infinities between these two infinities and are there bigger infinities right one can bigger infinities are actually can one can find out because if I take r then I think the power set of r will be a bigger infinity that is how you construct the bigger infinities. So, that was not a difficult question to answer, but the question was uh, whether these two infinities I mean I mean uh, so, LF naught and LF naught are different, are there infinities between them? So, so can I say there is an LF half or LF 3 by 4 or something like that, right? And uh, that is an uh, hypothesis uh, which I will come, which is the, so there are no infinities between infinity of natural numbers and infinity of uh, real numbers. That is an hypothesis, not a proved thing, okay? 
Later it was uh, said um, it was one of the problems in 20, uh, I mean Hilbert's problem and its validity was checked in the set theory notion in around 63. Anyway, these are uh, proofs. So, so, what I am trying to convey here from the fact that when a student comes, he does not understand these differences from the school from finiteness infinite. He has to be, uh, so he has to be given this thing and of course, we cannot see this thing and we can actually tell as a story to them. So, right, not, it is not part of a syllabus, but to prove these things requires an entire formal analysis to be done and we can tell them that we are training you for these understanding. I cannot just kind of prove it in say one lecture or one slide, right. So, be aware that we are going to do something later. So, be prepared motivated to do whatever you are doing now, ok. That is one way of uh, uh, motivating and the other thing I wanted to um, say here is that by the examples that we have here, it seems natural that I mean it kind of it seems like that the countable infinite infinity or like can some kind of discrete sets 0, 1, 2 some like right minus 1, minus 2 so on rationals are also kind of discrete set. Whereas, the uncountably infinite set seems to be some kind of continuum set all the elements between 0 and 1 all the elements on the real line. So, is it uh, is it true that uh, all the countably infinite sets are like this that is there is no discrete kind of set which is uncountably infinite and the answer is uh, no. So, that is where uh, so Cantor was working on this he actually gave an example of an uncountably infinite discrete kind of set. So, this set uh, kind of looks like points spread out, but it is actually as big as the real number or the interval 0 1 and I do not know. So, you have kind of seen this set before then I can skip this and I can move forward ok. I can I can quickly explain this. So, because this uh, this will give you the brilliance of uh, Cantor how we constructed that. So, he, what he did is he took the interval uh, 0 1 the interval 0 1 and what he did he trisected the interval right. So, he did so, he does 1 by 3, 2 by 3, 3 by 3. So, he divides the interval into 3 parts 0 1 interval and what he does he removes the open interval the middle open interval ok. So, he removes the middle open interval and what you get at level 1 I mean the second stage is this right this set in an open interval I remove the middle open interval that means I do not remove 1 by 3 I do not remove 2 by 3 but I remove all the points between them. Now, I do now I have this set in the third stage what I do I divide this interval into three parts as trisect this trisect this do the same process remove the middle open interval remove the middle open interval. I keep doing this infinite number of times ok and what he claims that the resulting set that I will get is more or less if you know measure theory or is more or less of length 0 that is the length of that set is 0, but the number of elements in the set is as big as the number of elements in the real line. It is completely counterintuitive, right and he constructed that set he actually proved that set. So, if you kind of repeat this process infinite number of times 0 1 2 3 4 infinite whatever you get at the end or points which are like spread like this the length of the set is 0 because it is just consisting of some points, but the uh, I mean the cardinality of the set is as big as real line or the interval 0 1. I mean what do you mean by the length I mean in that sense. So, when you say 0 1 what do you say the length. So, when, so so, when I say the length of an interval say a comma b what is it it is b minus a right. Now, this notion can be uh, so carried over to any subset of R right which is called the measure so which is what we do in measure theory right. So, we actually can like the way when we say area of a so, in two dimension it becomes area in three dimension it becomes volume in one dimension it becomes length right all these notion of so for instance, for instance so, so a singleton set has length 0. Yeah. Then this, uh, length is still same because the length of uh, minus 1 to 0 is 1 right because it is b minus a 0 minus minus 1 1. So, right that in all these intervals. So, if I take any interval a comma b. 
So that we understand for any interval length we understand but I am saying that this notion can be generalized to arbitrary subsets of R. So when I say length 0 for this set I mean it is actually a set which does not really contribute to the I mean the length is like a singleton, singleton has a measure 0 or something. So it is like that. So if I take 2 singletons at 2 different places their total length into it suppose I take a set x1, comma x2 set x1 is some number x2 is some number the length of that set is 0 which is a subset of R because it is length of this one set and length of that one set and length is something for disjoint sets if you have a length of 2 disjoint sets you can add them up right. Yeah, see that is uh, actually happens even here right, uh, even these, these are all sets of length 0, but they are countably infinite. What I have now told you is that I actually have a length 0 set which is also uncountably infinite, all these are of length 0. And so, so this set has length 0, this set has length 0, but this notion of length that I am using is a very generalized notion. It came after uh, Lebesgue introduced his notion of. Uh, when length is zero, they become countably infinite. Not necessarily. That's what I'm saying. So this example is uh, this example is one where length is zero, but it is uncountably infinite. So that's what I'm trying to tell you that infinity and length, because people used to believe that infinity and length are kind of something which is of zero length, which is which can be ignored, should be of very small set but need not it could be as big as r but could be very small length that is the so these two are different notion right I mean this this is a kind of counter intuitive stuff. So basically I am kind of uh, so getting you through the history of when people were trying to understand things many things we just assume right uh, okay this is there this is there okay this should be related but then someone says no this and this are different infinity and measure are different okay so anyway. So I have come to this. So this is uh, so if you have heard of Zeno's paradox. Um, so this is one of if you have done a calculus course, the first thing that they tell you in a calculus. I am very sorry. So the first thing uh, they do in a calculus course is what is called the continuum property of R. Anyone have remember what is the continuum property of R? So, if you remember the first, the, so the first thing they do is assume that R has this property and then you do all these things which is also called the least upper bound axiom if you learn that. So, any set which is bounded above has a least upper bound as a consequence you can conclude that any set which is bounded below has a greatest lower bound. This is an assumption that they make and then they do an then they do the entire calculus if you remember if you go back do that. Why do we even make this assumption because that is the first thing a student will ask I mean why are you even assuming this right there is a so uh, I will since I will not have much time I will just quickly uh, show you the other example where I want to show you this because this is uh, when you want to compute the area of say of a curved boundary I mean can any curved surface like say a circle. So for a circle the area say of circle of radius 1 the area is uh, pi how did they come up with this number pi and how did they I mean how do you even get that approximation is these right you basically try to approximate that by known regular polygons approximate them keep increasing them and you know the area of this whatever this blue region is and you in keep increasing that then you actually have a sequence of uh, numbers then you be and then you ask where does this sequence of numbers really go or converge right and then that number probably is the number which is the area of this. Now why would any sequence of number converge we do not know we need conditions on that not all sequence of numbers will converge right and this is what we study in any mathematics course right convergence of sequences series why do we study all these things for practical reasons right. So that is how these, uh, these things come so let me just explain uh, uh, this um, can paradox the answer is actually continuum property which I have already given to you. So what is this this is a paradox which was given by Zeno a Greek uh, philosopher some 2000 uh, years back. So he had uh, a book where he had some 40 paradoxes one of them was this. So he was basically asking this question um, 
is uh, that um, so there is a man so here he just gave the name of the greek hero like the way we are we, so we tend to give the name of rama or hanuman for anything that we want to say that guy gave the name of a greek hero so there is a man who is racing with a tortoise right and if i just go ask anyone there is a man and a tortoise racing who will win the race if the man is sensible is not giving is like not kind to the tortoise then he is going to win right so now what he is saying so the so then the way he poses a paradox is that he writes this as a conversation between the man and the tortoise so the tortoise tries to tell the man see you are faster than me and all that so what you do is that i will have a start ahead of you so we will not start at the same point so i will start ahead of you and you start behind me right then we will start the race then i can show you that i can win now this is also come because obviously this man can overtake at some point right but then this and the way he poses the product kind of he gives this as a conversation between this man and tortoise and he gives so then the tortoise argues how he will win the race so the so then the tortoise explains that okay i have a start at b you have a start at a okay so i have a distance of say b minus a between the man and the tortoise right so then the tortoise argues that whenever you reach b i would not have stood there i would have moved little it might be not as much as you have moved but little i would have moved so whenever you reach b i would have reached c when you have reached c i would have reached to a some nearby point ahead of c it may be small but it is still some point ahead of c so i will be at d when you reach d i would have reached a point bigger than d keep arguing this so then the tortoise said now just see you can never overtake me so i will win the race right look sensible right but does that happen in reality so what is actually happening so it's a sensible question continuous activity where we are treating this as a discrete as a separate as not a discrete separate no but here i am not even saying any, anything discrete as continuous i am just fixing points there is a point which is starting as a discrete right now when he might be running continuously but he will reach this point at whatever time it is right then that guy would have anyway moved whatever time it is you keep doing this now i can i, I can actually repeat this question in a different way i want to walk from here to that wall okay so can i walk or not assuming i can walk i am not lame everything i can i can reach that wall and touch that wall right now let me argue my walking process right so to walk that distance i first have to cross half of the distance right now to cross half of the distance i have to cross the one fourth of the distance keep doing this so what should i cross so i would have never started the walking process if i arg if i start arguing this what is happening here is in a sense i mean how do you fix this paradox with what happens in reality is that the man overtakes destination is same for both yes yes No, no one is stopping. They are in the running process. The destination point is same. The time taken for the man to reach the destination point, whether the tortoise are going to be actually. Yeah. So the destination point is somewhere here. Imagine. Okay. And no one is. So, the, so this man who is starting at A will not stop at B. This is a picture. So the same uh, logic has been applied for tortoise also. Yes, it is. It is being applied. So, so if there is an imaginary fly in front of the tortoise. Ah. Uh. so that is what is what we know by practice right but zeno is giving this i don't so let me argue from this this perspective right so here i am actually i mean at any point what you are saying that if he has to cross he has to cross tortoise at some point so the idea is that the speed will come between which you are not considering that is only what you are saying is the idea is tortoise is walking see no speed is being considered because when i say no. the distance between a b and distance between b c so this is actually a uh, kind of sequence of numbers which is decreasing is being considered the paradox is that achilles is running at a stop speed and he could maintain it yeah so the distance which he tra uh, travels within some time can be any it can be any but in that time because he the tortoise is ahead to achilles yeah he is also running at a constant speed it is very slow no i i i can i no i understand so i will kind of clarify what uh, you are saying the way the problem is posed it doesn't even take time into account because it doesn't matter to me 
So, the point that is it is treated as so the speed is taken into account in the way that the distance is reducing because I am I am not taking I am so No, not as a reaching point. No, no, it is the starting point of no, tortoise. Can we have the same argument with uh, point Z at the end of the line where a fly is also moving? Yeah, you are just complicating this uh, uh, with two people, you are going to have three people. Uh, yeah, it is not I agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, I am saying that that process. I don't think there is any discussion because we all know in reality what happens. Exactly. So, here it is It is not about that. It is, he is trying to do, he is, so what Zeno is trying to do is trying to divide a finite process into an infinite process and he says that if I actually go through the infinite process, I am not able to achieve the finite process. But we in practice achieve the finite process. So, his aim is basically in the sense that there are infinities which are infinite to right to us right which are infinity to us and which we never reach right but then maybe in in some setup we can actually achieve that for instance i can i mean just to put things in the perspective for what here i said 0 and r are of same cardinality that is the number of points in both the interval 0 1 and the number of points in r are same right so suppose think of that i'm going to walk from 0 to 1. So, my walking length is say the real line, I am walking on the real line, I am going to say step on all the points. Okay? And if you think of this as a distance, then I can never complete the walk of r, but I can complete the walk of 0 1, but I am achieving the same number of points as r in 0 1, but I can never do it in r. So, these, so one has to distinguish these things is the idea of this paradox. Right? 0 1 interval so, a distance of 1 I can walk which has same number of points, but I can walk. I cannot walk the same number of points on a real line, they are different. So, these things have to be distinguished is what I am trying to. So, one has to distinguish I mean kind of infinity and these things are different. So, here the motivation is to actually say that. So, the answer to this paradox is this that there is a point where this guy will overtake that is there is an upper bound where this guy is going to go and that is basically the converging so convergence of this sequence and so on and that is the point even here as well okay so we have spent too much time on this anyway so so that's the idea of continuum property and this is the first thing that we learn in the calculus course which is in, which is assumed in the calculus course now there is something else which we do is the rearrangement of series again with infinite series for instance 1 plus 2 plus 3 whatever order you sum them is same you will not uh, doubt me on that right but the same process cannot be repeated when you have its kind of infinite set of numbers which you are adding up right when you, so when i say infinite set of number adding up it means series right series basically means that so what is the series is 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 this ideally we know from our definition of uh, say convergence of partial sums and so on is a diverging actually oscillating series diverging series because it is going to have uh, the sequence of partial sums as 1 0 1 0 1 0 which is not a converging series right this is fine now this rearrangement of series so again with infinite series we cannot employ this property of adding in any order will give you the same thing is not necessary because if you think of it roughly like this if i add the series in this order first one minus one second and the third and fourth element so on i am each term is zero so zero plus zero plus zero it's zero Whereas, if I sum them in this order, I leave the first term, sum the second and third and so on, they are all 0, 0, 0, 0, I will get 1, okay? but 0 which means 0 is equal to 1, where 0 is not 1. So, what is the problem here? The problem is you cannot rearrange series like this okay? and this is a very, very famous classical result of uh, Riemann's rearrangement theorem which he actually proved almost some 170, 80 years back. He basically said that uh, only a conditionally convergent series can be rearranged to converge to uh, sorry any any conditionally convergent series can be rearranged to converge to any real number not just 0 1 I can rearrange them to get any real number you want. So, you should not treat infinity in the way we understand finite whatever we do in finiteness we cannot do it in infinity which is why we do rearrangement of series I because at least when I was a student I, I used to ask a lot of questions and 
I never used to get answer from teachers like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? They used to tell that, you wait and see, you will see. I did not see um, even after 15 years till I became a teacher. So, <laughs> so I'm just trying to tell you um, whatever, I mean, so all the questions which I asked as a student, which I got an an kind of answer after I become a teacher. Because I have to answer to my students when they ask me, right? What? So this is one reason why we do rearrangement of series. Other thing is about uh, continuous function, right? I mean, and this is again something, um, if, if you, I, I don't know how we continuous function introduced to you, we usually engineers deal it with that limit, uh, something converges, something uh, converges. But if you do a mathematics course, the definition is for every given epsilon, there is a delta such that something hap uh, such that whenever something is smaller than delta in that region, the function is smaller than epsilon. That is how, I mean the graph of the function is uh, bounded there is what you usually do as a definition of continuous function. But 200 years back, or even 300 years back, this was not the definition. The definition was very simple and nice, which all you like. What is a continuous function? Anything that I can draw on a piece of paper on a board without lifting my hand. Okay? It's a nice definition. You would like it, right? And that is how it should have been, right, even today. But that is not the case. So that definition uh, did not, in, uh, so when people actually worked on problems, they realized that that definition was, so that understanding was not enough to solve the problems a much more minute uh, as a kind of minute scrutiny into the continuous function told them that there are minute things that happens. So, this definition is not right. So, what actually happens is uh, this. So, what is a continuous discontinuous function? Discontinuous means there is a point where there is a jump for the function, right. That is what discontinuity means. Now, how is that rephrased in mathematics is basically this that for any given epsilon, okay, for any given epsilon, I can find a delta here such that you will have a rectangle here which is of epsilon delta sides, right. So, there is an epsilon uh, side and the delta side rectangle and the graph of the function will lie, will enter once and exit once from the edges of the rectangle, right, without jumping. Suppose you had a jump, what would have happened is that, suppose you think of a jump, I do not have a chalk, it is fine. Um, suppose you think of a jump at this point any epsilon that I take, if I take a delta which is smaller than the distance between the points of jump, then that rectangle will fall here and the graph will go out of that. Can you see what I am saying? Suppose you think of a jump, so this is a discontinuous function, right. So, the point of discontinuity is, uh, is at here, right. So, now if I take any epsilon, okay, now this is this, right. So, uh, no, sorry, if I take any epsilon, if I choose delta such that I, I take this rectangle around this point, right, this would be epsilon. I can choose a delta such that I can build a rectangle like this, right. Right, so I think I'm uh, I'm not drawing the picture properly, but uh, the idea is that that if I have a discontinuous function, I can choose this delta here such that this will not be sitting inside the rectangle. Right, so that's the idea of the definition that we usually introduce to these students as a continuous function. And okay, then uh, this is something which we don't do at that level, but this is to tell you the. In, uh, intuition, what people used to think of, uh, because once you have a continuous function, what, why, so why do you have continuous function? To understand curves, right. Curves are continuous function, that is how they thought of. In fact, curves were thought out, people are actually kind of thinking of them as uh, one dimensional object sitting in embedded in some higher dimension object, right. And they are usually th were kind of thought of as piecewise differentiable functions. So, piecewise differentiable, except at some countable number of points, they were a differentiable functions, right. But then someone came and said, no, actually case, uh, so curves, though they are one dimension object, okay, uh, they can actually fill a two dimensional object continuously, okay. This is, uh, this is counterintuitive. I have a one dimension object. I am saying that I can fill it in a two dimensional object, okay, where 
they were thinking of curves as piecewise differentiable. That means you have see what is differentiability? It's like breaking it. I mean, putting a edge at some point, right? I mean, kind of sorry, non-differentiability means that. So when you say differentiability, you don't do that. Without doing that, you are going to get a continuous curve, which is a one-dimensional object going to fill into a two-dimensional object. So that again was a counterintuitive process. So this is what is so this what I example I have given here is the Hilbert's curve, but the first example was the Piano's curve. So here, what they do is that this is a curve that they construct. They say if I repeat. So if I repeat this process infinite number of times, then I am going to get a curve which is which is actually going to touch all the points of this square. Now, how is this curve constructed? I first have a square. I just uh, divide the square into four parts. I just join the midpoints. Okay. So you so you can think of this as this 0, 1, 2, 3 being straightened out into a uh, Curve. So, what do I want? I, I have a square, I have a straight line. So, right kind of curve means a straight line is being taken, twisted and put inside some higher dimension space, right? That is what is being done. So, here I am taking a straight line, trying to twist it and put inside such that it fills, so it touches all the points of the square. So, what is this process? Again, so what I do is that I divide this into four, join the midpoints. Then, what I do each smaller square that I have here, I divide them into 4 again, right. So, now I have this uh, 4 cross 4, right. There again what I do, I repeat the process, in each of the square I join the centers, like I have joined the centers here, I have joined the centers here, here also I should join the centers here ideally like this. How many? 4. Okay. So, what I should have done is, if I have to repeat this process, I should have done this. Okay. So, the second stage, so first stage I do this, second stage I do this and I think of this as putting it like this. I first draw this, next this, this, this. So, I just, if I, I so I can just remove this box, put it here. So, that is how I get the straight line. So, these four boxes I put it here, I have to join these lines, that is how I am going to get the curve, that was the idea. So, they want to repeat this process infinitely to get the real line. So, what should I do? As I have this, this edge after that I start here, so I should connect this and this, and then this and this, and then this and this, and then I stop here. This looks ugly, strange, right. So, what I am doing is that I am actually connecting this and this bus kind of crossing over. So, what I should actually do is that I just rotate this, flip this. So, if I flip this is what, if I flip this bottom two such that this distance that I am joining is the shortest distance that I am joining. Basically, I flip this like this. So, I just draw the lower part again. The lower part I have this, I make it like this, this one I make it like this. Now, whatever I have joined becomes this and this. So, I am going to have precisely what you see here. Repeat this process and the idea of this uh, entire thing is that if you keep repeating this process, you actually have a curve which is going to touch all this point and this was another step which, which gained some because then people really uh, can thought okay, curves were actually not something like this. They were right because there is a one dimensional object actually spanning, I mean kind of covering a two dimensional object. So, that is why it is called a space filling curve. I think today, today these things are, I do not know, there are, he, he might know or there are, you are all. Sharp corners in a curve. Hmm? Sharp, sharp corners. That is fine, I am just saying it, it is, it, so it is a continuous curve, I do not want differentiability. This, which is what I am trying to tell you that curves need not be, curves are continuous functions. What I am saying is that people used to imagine curves as something that was always piecewise differentiable. Today the definitions that we see have all evolved and changed because of these understanding that people have brought in. Someone tells you no that understanding is wrong, you see this can happen. So, you have to modify your notion of uh, definition change. 
yeah you can think of this as a function right so if i take a line okay and i just bend that line and put so this curve that you see here this is a line which i have taken just and bent it like this and put it there so think of a string or thread that i take from 0 1 i put it bent it at some point put it bent it so it is a curve right so wherever we have the see, bend from x axis why would we have multiple values from that perspective it's not a problem. no it is a map from uh, so any curve if you look at the definition of a curve if I call a curve gamma, it is a map and if I think of a curve in R2, it is a map from A comma B okay, to R2. That means every point which is the parameterization of the curve that you uh, all you understand as a parameterization of the curve right, which basically tells you that the point T between A and B goes to some X comma T and Y comma T, it is in that sense right. So, each of this is in that sense and the limit of these curves is going to do what I want that is filling uh, kind of filling the space ok. And the next thing after continuity we, we study is uh, differentiability, I will quickly run through. One major notion which people used to imagine before was um, you cannot have a continuous function which is not differentiable at every point. Right, see, see when you think of a continuous function which is not differentiable, you imagine something like a mod x. The point where there is a vertex or a corner kind of thing is, is the non-differentiable point. Now, I can imagine a curve which has many edges or kind of many vertex, many kind of corners, right. So, people thought that you cannot have a curve which is continuous which has corners at every point. Continuous, but corners at every, so like something like mod x at every point. So, people uh, so did not think that was possible. Then Weierstrass actually came and said yes that was possible and he gave an example, now there are many, which so he gave an example of uh, functions where, uh, which, so this is a function where it is non-differentiable at every point, but it is a continuous function. So okay. Which one? Wave. Yeah, uh, I do not know what is square, what is square wave. No, but no, but that is not even a function, right? It is multi. It's like a multi-valued, right? Right? Because at one point there are. Uh, no, no. This is not that. This is much Fourier transform actually has some kind of uh, regularity assumption in that. So, so this is nothing. To f so this actually has a structure of what is called fractals. Now, um, today we know it as a fractals. So each of each smaller region has uh, can repeats its own process. Uh, so, the idea here is this is again something which was counterintuitive. a continuous I mean a continuous see what is the so what is non differentiability that you think of right. This is the point where you have non differentiability what I am and all these points are continuous points what I am asking is you have a edge like this at every point can you can even imagine that right. So, it is in that sense right. See what we understand today is what how people understood at some point. Some genius mind had to come and say correct it and then things change. In fact, after this kind of uh, results is when the definition of continuity actually changed. It became what we in, so in fact, Weierstrass was the one who introduced the epsilon delta definition that I just showed you some time back. Anyway, so this is. that is a outcome of the definition that I told you. So, the what you define as a limit is following that when so, so a function f is continuous if I have a sequence x n which is which is converging to some point x. So, so I say f is continuous at x naught if for any sequence. So, for every x n that converges to this f of x 1 will converge to f of x naught. In general this is not true this could be some limit l but when that limit l is same as the value of f at that x naught then f is continuous. This is actually a consequence of that. So, that is a property uh, the way we see it today. Yeah, because that is simpler. That is ok. I mean for all for all practical purposes that is ok, but that is not going to give you I mean that is not going to give kind of give you the intuition into these kind of issues I mean the counterintuitive issues that I am showing you. 
So the reason why people change, so people actually had these kind of definitions even before. So as, as I said, after a continuous curve being drawn without lifting the hand, from there they evolved into all these definitions. And then finally stopped at a place where I showed you epsilon delta. Unless the genius mind comes and shows us something else and changes the definition. right? So till now that is the definition. And that was this guy. So actually Viestras was the one who gave that epsilon delta, that triangle, that I mean the rectangle kind of notion that I showed you. Fine. So that kind of completes the calculus part. So mostly in calculus that is what we do. right? Uh, real numbers, sequences, series, continu uh, continuous functions, differential functions and some other things is what. And what I showed you is not what we do in the course, but we want students to understand these kind of counterintuitive stuff at the end of the course or even later on their own, but kind of introduce the tools towards that. That is the main aim, right? Be uh, see, because all these have applications, right? And I do not know, but some engineer friends tell me that when you have kind of circuit board, when you want to connect, you have a board and you want a uh, connection, uh, some kind of connection happening in a continuous, I mean, because all connections are continuous, right? and you want to do it as small as you want, that means you should be able to fill, I mean kind of use as many points on the square board that you have. And these are the kind of uh, stuffs that is used there. And in fact, this is also used in notions uh, like if you have a 2D image that is actually converted into a uh, sound frequency one dimensional image using this, this map actually, mm -hmm. this kind of Hilbert curves. So they actually, I do not know, if you, maybe you can Google like, so hearing an image. Okay. So, image you usually see. Uh, so, hearing an image is the concept where they convert an image into a sound wave thing, one dimensional sound wave, uh, I mean kind of frequency using these maps. So, these are used for some kind of optimization processes and all so on. Anyway, so I am not expert in that. So, engineers you should know how you use it. So, you can tell me. So, uh, I think I will quickly uh, summarize and stop. So, linear algebra compliance an analysis is the one that we teach not complex analysis, linear algebra and ODE, but I have swapped the order for convenience. Um, it's not that it matters. So, here I do not have to tell you the motive, why we study system of linear equation, why should I solve a system of linear equation, you all know. If you are electrical engineer, you will know. If you are any other engineer, if you are a chemist, you will know and all that. Right? So, but what I do not, uh, I mean what I usually uh, find students not understanding is the notion of determinant. Right? And I do not think it is even explained. Uh, uh, very well that I mean one can explain this. So, basically determinant is, uh, is a quantity that actually measures the volume distortion of because if you have a uh, system of linear equation you can think of that as mapping some, so some map between R n to R n. So, it is going to transform some region to some region. So, how much volume distortion will happen uh, between the I mean during the map how much volume distortion happens is what is measured by determinant. And, it, and usually the formula for this is this, but if you actually see it actually comes from how we solve a uh, two, can two variable two, uh, can, uh, system of equations. right? There is this a d minus b c that appears as a common co kind of constant while solving for x and y and this is that is the probably the matrix that you augment and so on. right? So, uh, and if you generalize this to higher dimensions accommodating uh, kind of formal mathematics, this is the formula that you get. Right? So, when I show this formula, it gets confused, but when you actually motivate, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I am not, I did not, uh, that was not part of the course, because, no, no, the here, whatever I this one right. This I just uh, said to answer this continuum hypothesis that there are no infinities between them. That is actually part of uh, what is called the set theory and logic part course and that is much later you actually need, uh, you actually need Gödel's uh, I think right, Gödel's incompleteness theorem or something is required to actually prove this. That is much more advanced. This is not part of the syllabus. What, what I show like this is the part of the syllabus. All that I am discussing is just motivation to the students of why we are doing what we are doing. So, in case you, I mean we do not know, we can actually use these to motivate the students, right. Then they get interested because usually their question is why am I studying whatever you are, I mean you are giving me. And they usually study from the point of view of exam. 
at the end of the semester, what grade will you give me, sir? Right? That's the that's the motivation that they have. Anyway, so uh, let me quickly and this again something we do complex numbers, complex analysis. No one tells us why are we doing complex numbers and complex analysis. Not that we need to do that, right? But then why would any sane person introduce an imaginary number, right? Why would he do that, right? I mean, and that no one tells. And imagination. Sorry. Aren't real numbers and imagination? Yeah, but then, uh, but then ha that had a practical. I mean, I mean, there was a say suppose. A complex numbers. No, there is a. Uh, it, it, it was not an imagination as such. There was so there were practical reasons to introduce them for convenience sake. That is the reason why complex numbers were introduced. But what is that reason? So, yeah, so which, uh, I mean, why would, I mean, so what brings in complex numbers? What enforces us or what kind of what forces us to do, I um, can introduce the complex number. At least I had that question when I was a student. No one answered me. I mean, I understand. I is uh, root of uh, minus 1. That is how they introduced and then they started putting one more dimension and everything else was done. I understood everything else after that, whatever they told me. Why are you introducing root of minus 1? Root of minus 1 basically you are saying you are solving. There are certain equations that you cannot solve until that equation. Exactly, right. That they never showed me. And the, and the reason is this. So, which means that if we are able to solve those equations today without the help of those numbers, then we can actually throw away complex numbers. If we can. Yeah, but that is an application of thing. When complex number was introduced around, uh, uh, I think, 15th century, okay, and that guy was a pure uh, mathematician who did not uh, understand whatever you just said, and he introduced complex numbers, right? And he and prob and he did it, right? Now the point is, can we? Uh, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. See, these are interpretation of physical activities after we know complex numbers and other thing. But that is not how it was uh, introduced into the system or into the subject, right? That is precisely. Uh, so, the, so the way he answered the reason was because we actually had real equations with real coefficients, which had real roots, but there was no way to compute those real roots without you actually have the freedom of moving out from real to complex numbers without solving that x square. See x square plus 1 is what you are solving, right? This is what you are solving, right? And if you are solving this, I do not have to solve this. I know there is no solution to this because x square is always positive. It is a theorem, it is a result, it is a fact that we know. So, if I know this as a fact, no sane person is going to go and solve this. I will say there is no solution to this, just stop there. I will not even look for an x which is minus 1 because it cannot happen, right. But the reason why we do this, I mean it started like that and it had great um, application in because that kind of facilitated because whatever we do is for convenience, right. So, that actually made kind of simplified. So, this process helped us in solving one such, I mean quickly one such equation is this. I know that this is a, I mean the roots of this is this, but try solving it this just by using the formula without directly uh, just taking the common x out and whatever factoring it and so on. You cannot solve this without solving this equation, okay. Similarly, complex analysis, it is uh, complex analysis came for harmonic function, the fact that she is there that means I should get out very far, <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah thanks, <laughs> anyway I think I am almost done. So, if I have to solve a one dimensional Laplace equation, I know this is the solution of that, one can quickly do it. If I ask the same question in, uh, if I ask the same question in higher dimension say in two dimension, I can solve this in this completeness that way that I have by introducing complex analysis and complex function that just 
gives a complete solution to this. Otherwise, if you just try doing this in the two dimensions, you have lots of functions as such sitting in the real variable theory. All the solutions, all the functions that satisfies this, you do not see any connection between them at all. It just looks random. There is some, I, I actually, I should have shown some solutions of this. But if you look at the two dimensional solution of these things, they do not have random. I think something like e power, my, e, so e power x minus e power y will also satisfy, and there are, there are many solutions which satisfies this, but they do not seem to have any relation between them. That commonality you understand when, once you see them from the perspective of complex function and, and, and that is how the co uh, all that Cauchy Riemann equation and all that you see comes in. Anyway, I think uh, this is ODE PD. I will stop uh, with that one question of ODE PD uh, without I mean answering the answer is method of characteristics. What I usually see is um, uh, is this that when I have a ODE, what is the number of conditions that I need to impose to solve an ODE? So, there is a theorem that tells you that right. If I have any nth order or kth order ODE, I need to have as many boundary conditions right or initial conditions to solve that right. Same thing with P D again you have an equation if I have first order equation I need that many conditions. So, for a first order I need one condition to solve it. So, they so basically well postness of a differential equation right. Now, you look at I just showed you Laplacian right sometime I just showed you Laplacian here. What is the boundary condition that you usually impose for a problem like that? Only one condition on the boundary, right? Look at a parabolic, you just uh, use one condition and one initial condition, right? Ideally, it is a second order equation, right? It should have two conditions, right, to solve it. I mean, it to, to make it well post, but it seems that it is well post already. In fact, giving that extra information is actually uh, kind of what is that called over post or how does why does that happen the answer to all that is the method of characteristics the method of characteristics which you do in first or so first dimension i'm sorry first order equation so can also be done for second order but in first order it just gives you the i mean so it reduces the first order pd to a system of odes and whenever you can solve the system of odes you have solved the first order pd <coughs> but in the second order pd the same method if you try to Im impose it seems to divide the class of second order equation into three categories like in, in fact only in two dimensions it is three categories in higher dimension there are actually four uh, which actually which is elliptic parabolic and hyperbolic and the property that a second order equation belongs to one of this class tells you what boundary condition makes it well posed and that is what we usually impose ok the answer lies there. So, these are st because ODPD course we actually kind of show students right start with an equation with a boundary condition we tell them what is the method to solve it and they also very happily know how to solve it. So, give them a PD they know how to solve it, but why that condition why that many is enough these are analysis which we do no we, we do not answer that. So, it is in that sense anyway I will stop here thanks. <laughs>